were a kid, you were deeply sensitive and you cared about small animals and you didn't want anyone to suffer and you had a lot of love in your heart to give. You're part of a family. There are more of you than you know. You grew up in a culture and a society that makes no sense. There's no connection to wisdom. So the fact that you feel depressed, the fact that you feel crazy, is a sign of your intelligence. And when you walk down the street from now on and you look people in the eyes, you'll start recognizing members of your family. Hello everyone, this is Unbroken Chain and I'm Mara James. So, so happy to share a conversation with Juliana McCarthy today. She's an energy healer and an astrologist, and her writing about astrology has been such a gift for me and for so many people, I think, because she's taken astrology out from under the New Age umbrella and put it back into myth and spirit and The way that she writes about it is an invitation to imagination for all of us, and it's really opened me to new perspectives. It's been a really beautiful journey. This conversation is so much more than that. She shares her personal journey and her path through Buddhism and plant medicines. Her Instagram is Ethereal Culture, and if you don't know it, go find it now. Enjoy Juliana McCarthy. So what is our relationship to the stars? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Big questions. <Yeah. laughs> Might as well just go right for it. <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. I mean, for me, on the ultimate level, this is all kind of an illusion. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think of astrology as this in-between realm, this realm that's in between human being and or being human Mm. you know and then the ultimate realm of oneness you know Mm. and so in buddhism it's called the sambhokakaya realm and that's where the deities live and the wisdom energies and the spirits and the guides and so i put astrology in that category where it's sort of a vehicle to help us as humans connect to the highest realm of oneness and to remember who we are in an ultimate sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so on a more mundane level, I think astrology helps us uh, have a language to understand our patterns and proclivities Mm -hmm. and potentials, Mm -hmm. you know, and also to have a kind of more neutral or objective compassion for who we are instead of saying, oh, I'm this way, it's a problem, I, I don't want to be that way anymore. It's saying, I am this way, and this is my struggle, which can also lead mm. to my greatest potential for wisdom and offering to mm. the world, you know? I don't know, I was like a really good swimmer when I was a kid and I would win all the races so I didn't try. And then and then like all the kids that had to try really hard ended up surpassing me. And so it's sort of like that, where the things we struggle at actually become our greatest gifts, you know? And so Mm. knowing what our struggles are, knowing what our gifts are and working with it more consciously, it helps us A, become more of who we are understand more of who we are and be kind of uh have more compassion for who we are and for who others are yeah you know it's like if something really annoys you about someone and then you see oh well you're (laughs) you're you're virgo or whatever i am a virgo that's why i can say that but uh, (laughs) i'm a hamster wheel spinning over analyzing but um (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you're a Virgo. And so this is your struggle. And but this is your gift. You know, it's like you maybe you spin and overanalyze, but you and care too much. But that's also like beautiful. You care too much and you're loyal and you want to be of service and you want to help people, you know. And so it kind of gives you a bigger picture of like who this person is in the context of their neuroses or Mm. their gifts or their beauty you know and then it um and it gives you this sort of objective clarity of like feeling compassion for the 
gifts and struggles that we've come in with. That is exactly the gift that I feel like you've brought into my life since I've been reading your writing is just these really beautiful reminders that there's a bigger context to whatever I'm experiencing in the moment. And that's so powerful. And also it puts me in place with everyone else in the world. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that when we're feeling raw and vulnerable alone at home, (laughs) that it turns out a lot of people are feeling the same way and that that's actually reflected in the stars, you know, and then rather than wallowing or, you know, going under with those feelings, we can say, oh, this is sort of connected to the greater trajectory of where we're all going as a collective, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is a mass purification that begins with our personal hearts, you know, but we're all connected as we feel these feelings and, and purge and allow, you know, for a release so we can make way for this new paradigm that's coming in together what is the new paradigm that's coming (laughs) well it's like things have been intense Mm. as most people have noticed Mm. (laughs) and it's actually astrologically a time where we're ending an age of humanity or several ages in humanity and, and about to begin new ages in humanity you know and so that's happening on a few different levels one is we're we're beginning the aquarian age right now some astrologers say we've already begun there is debate as to when exactly it started but in my mind it sort of started with the great american eclipse last summer um and then the second paradigm that's beginning is in 2020 we're ending the industrial age you know, which began in the 19th century, and we're beginning the, the next age in 2020. And if you look at a timeline of humanity, at the beginning of every new age in humanity, there is a Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn. Mm-hmm. And so if you need tangible evidence that astrology is real, that's a pretty uh, convincing correlation. Um, And what does that arrangement, what kind of energy comes from that arrangement? Well, uh, so Pluto is death and rebirth, and Saturn is government structures, systems, Mm. heads of government, you know, and it's it's a system. So it's like this new system coming together through a death and rebirth. You know, Capricorn is government systems, you know, it's ruled by Saturn. So it's like this death and rebirth of the current paradigm. It's also the way things have been, Capricorn and Saturn. So we're having a death and rebirth of the old ways, the old structures, the old systems, Mm -hmm. you know. And in 2020, not only will Saturn and Pluto be conjunct in Capricorn, but Jupiter will also be conjunct Saturn and Pluto, which hasn't happened for 2200 years. And so what that means astrologically is we're actually beginning a golden age, Mm. you know. And so with the death and rebirth energy comes this deep need for a purge, you know, a purging out of the old, a purging out of what no longer is going to serve us, you know. And we're closing the gap. Like we began this Pluto Uranus square right before Hitler came to power Mm. then there was an opposition during the 60s cultural revolution and then the 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 final square was um, to close this pattern was 2012 and then this Trump thing came about you know and so we're actually closing out this sort of horror horror of humanity and purging out the sort of residue of things like misogyny and racism and homophobia and this exclusivity and this sort of steep patriarchal hierarchy, you know? And Pluto is, again, death and rebirth, and Uranus is rapid change, you know? It's like shock and change and revolution. And so there's a lot happening right now. And not only that, but this new age that's beginning is a matriarchal age for the first time in 6,500 years. And that has to do with the North Node being in Cancer as this paradigm shift occurs. And Cancer is the the feminine, the mother, the matriarch. Oh, yay. (laughs) Yeah, and so it this is um it's also vulnerability and mm. feelings and um coming out of our shells, right? To be exposed, you know, and 
to feel our feelings together. And Uranus um, just moved into Taurus and Chiron just moved into Aries. So we're, you know, Uranus is breaking free liberation. Taurus is the places where we're most stuck. So we're mm. in that phase right now. Chiron moved into Aries in April for the first time since the 60s, right before Martin Luther King was assassinated. And Aries is violence and Chiron is the wounded healer, you know. But Aries is also the masculine and the self. And Chiron is, you know, where we're, we need to heal our deepest wounds in order to be warriors of tenderness. And so we're in that phase very much so right now, too, of healing the masculine, recalibrating the masculine as we prepare for this new feminine and, you know, mm. feminine ruled age. Mm. Um, so what does that mean for us as individuals? Are we kind of like little antennas to this energy or are we actors that have free will and choice in how we respond? Well, both, yeah. <laughs> I think we all feel it, whether or not we're conscious of it or working with it consciously. But we all have an inner masculine. We all have an inner feminine. And both of those things are being recalibrated right now. So for us as individuals, the question is, where have I been too uh, forceful, aggressive, angry, mm -hmm simple-minded perhaps um where have I been too stubborn you know <laughs> and <laughs> and then where do I need to really step into the power of my vulnerability how can I redefine my strength not as being aggressive or a bully or a narcissist but as being a tender emotional <laughs> vulnerable exposed receptive being yeah. you know and that's like much deeper power actually you know uh that's much more uh multi-dimensional power it's not linear it's not bulldozy you know mm -hmm. it's like uh it saturates instead of punches oh i love that yeah <laughs> so it's like really make affecting change from the inside instead of you know trying to destroy through brute force yes <laughs> yeah i'm glad you're talking about vulnerability because i feel like i've been learning so much about that in the past few months just in the way i've been traveling through the world and really relying on people's generosity and kindness because it seems like when i am able to meet the world in vulnerability the world shows up with that same, it, it wants to meet me there in that place, but it's like making that first step, that first invitation, that first opening, like that's the, that's what everyone's looking for and waiting for. It's such a good point. It's so true that our universe or our world, it reflects how we're showing up, you know, and if if we feel like the world is unkind and ungenerous, the question would be, where are we being unkind or ungenerous, you know? But if we're showing up in that vulnerable space of wanting to connect and wanting to receive, then there's so much to receive and there's so many like-minded, like-hearted people who are ready to enter into that space also. You know, I think so many of us are lonely and like we really do want to connect mm -hmm. but it requires courage you know for the first person to take a leap and open into that vulnerability and invite the other person to meet them there and to have the courage to face rejection yes you know yes. and to know that that's not because you're deficient mm -hmm. you know but it's because someone else is is suffering more than you perhaps mm -hmm. you know and so that's part of this shift too is like becoming more self-sufficient in our own source of worthiness and self-love mm -hmm. and being willing to take more risks because we know who we are and we know that we're basically good and nothing outside of us can detract from that understanding mm -hmm. and that source is infinite yeah. totally so so there's what's happening 
astrologically right now that affects all of us but then what is the relationship of what happens at the moment that we're born and how that relates to our presence in the world uh, basically a natal chart is sort of one of the key tools in astrology and it's a map of the planets at the moment of your first breath and so when you look at the position of the planets in the sky at any moment and you compare it to where they were at the moment of your first breath that tells you how they're personally affecting you right now like any any transit is going to fall in some place in your chart you know and a chart uh, is divided into 12 houses and each of the houses has a different significance so like the seventh house is relationships and the tenth house is career and the fifth house is creativity and children the twelfth house is spirituality etc and so wherever the transits are occurring will always be in a house you mm. know and so that's sort of the first thing to look at is like what house is this eclipse falling in or what house is this new moon falling in and you have a better idea of how these collective energies are personally affecting you you know and then maybe it's forming a, a significant angle to your sun or your moon or one of your main planets and it's like mm. Okay, Uranus just shifted into Taurus and it's forming a opposition or a 180 degree angle to my Venus. So I'm getting out of my relationship ruts right now. Like literally that's me. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Uranus is like revolution and unsticking, you know, and Venus is relationships and love and so it's like unsticking in a kind of intense way because it's an opposition which is a really kind of <laughs> intense angle mm -hmm. you know so it's really confronting me with this disruption you know and so that's sort of how you un start unpacking the transits looking at the houses and what houses the transits are falling in and then seeing what angles the transiting planets are forming to your natal planets mm -hmm. does that make sense totally okay. yeah yeah, I'd love to hear more about your process because the way you're talking about it makes me realize how personal it is, which I think translates in, in your writing, even though the way that you present it lets me see my life completely in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I feel everything. Like, I feel so much. I feel a million feelings at any given moment. So <laughs> I think that's what makes me... Uh, no, a decent astrologer is that I feel so much. I feel the planetary transits, the collective energies. I feel my feelings and what other people are feeling. And so um, when I'm writing about astrology, I'm really writing what's helping me through all of my feelings. I'm helping myself kind of contextualize everything that I'm feeling and work with it instead of it working me and so most mm. of what I write is extremely personal incognito <laughs> you know it's like, oh, like a page of my diary <laughs> of like what I'm working through and how I am addressing it for myself and it's also I don't think I would do it otherwise so regularly I do it because I have to mm. you know I, and I know Joan Didion, my favorite writer said that once too or she said I write because that's how I figure things out and that's why I do astrology. It's because it helps me personally figure mm. out what I'm feeling. Mm. <laughs> and then I offer that. And it it's always resonates. And the more personal it gets, the more it seems to resonate with more people. You know, yeah. which surprises me. But another writer I love, Paul Oster, came to my writing class once in college. And he said, um, universality lies in the details. Ooh. Yeah, and so I think... A lot of people try to water down and generalize to like broaden their audience, but it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> it's like the more specific you get, the more people seem to relate and resonate with it. So that's how I do it. Just A, because I wouldn't do it otherwise. <laughs> B, it actually seems to be more effective. So. Yeah, yeah. Your, your truth and transparency and your work is a gift for all of us. Oh, yeah, that's sweet. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I guess on that note, I, I'd love to hear a little bit of your journey to coming to this point in your life. Did you grow up with spirituality? Has this been an intentional process? Oh, yeah. So, well, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up a Christian scientist, which is not Scientology. 
<laughs> it's actually I think of it as like the Buddhism of Christianity. Whoa. And it's very much about mind over matter and seeing the world not as solid and understanding that your mind is incredibly powerful and can alter physical reality and and it's almost like learning how to exit the matrix you know mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like understanding that you can heal anything within your body through the power of mind and heart and and so that was an interesting way to grow up you know <laughs> like questioning reality and being told at like five that the table isn't as solid as it appears you know wow. did that mean something to you at that age yeah I think I definitely was a deep thinker as as a very young kid, you know, and was constantly sort of relating to the world as multidimensional, mm-hmm. you know, and understanding that we can get locked into like two-dimensional, three-dimensional thinking, but there are actually far more dimensions than that, and that the essence of a table is more important than the table itself. And so what's the essence of a table? It's like support and... Or, you know, I mean, that was sort of how I was trained to think about the world. Yeah, so that was really powerful. And my grandmother was a Christian science practitioner, which is basically an energy healer, you know, and was helping people who were struggling change their thoughts to sort of come out of their suffering. And I didn't put it together until later that like, oh, yeah, this is in my family lineage. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she really was an energy healer. I you know, after I'd already entered that path, I put it together, but, um, so I grew up with that, and then I moved to New York when I was 17, and I was part of a artistic, creative, sensitive group of friends who had all kind of not belonged wherever (laughs) we came from, and all found ourselves in New York City, you know, at young, a young age, and we kind of came to age, sorry, came of age together, and a really vulnerable time in our lives and in the world. You know, 9-11 happened um, during that time. And and then a lot of our friends started dying and committing suicide and ODing. And one got struck by lightning. Another got, had a surfing accident. And it was like just a lot of tragedy. And I was struggling a lot, you know, with all the death and all the grief and my own sense of purpose in the world. And a lot of us started seeing a Buddhist therapist on the Upper West Side (laughs) named Bernie Weitzman. (laughs) He's like 85 or 87 now. Um, (laughs) And he became our wise elder. And he was wild and creative also and plays the banjo really beautifully and he was friends with Allen Ginsberg and we were all pretty smitten with him and his wildness and his stories and his wisdom and I remember the first time I went to see him the whole room filled with white light and I could only see his like blue eyes and I was like Bernie I think I need to go to the mental hospital (laughs) It's like, I can only see white light and your eyeballs. <laughs> he's like, it's normal. Yeah, he's like, I hallucinate all the time. It's a sign you're on the right path. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and so it was like, instead of telling us we were crazy for having these sensitivities to energy, he was showing us how to work with them and how to see them as messages from the universe and our higher selves like he didn't talk about it that way but he was cutting through our trips and cutting through our self-judgments and cutting through societal norms and I remember he said to me when you were a kid you were deeply sensitive and you cared about small animals and you didn't want anyone to suffer and you had a lot of love in your heart to give which was all true and he was like you're part of a family there are more of you than you know and when you walk down the street from now on and you look people in the eyes you'll start recognizing members of your family and tears were streaming down I had no idea what he was talking about but tears were streaming down my face and he's like you grew up in a culture and a society that makes no sense There's no connection to wisdom. So the fact that you feel depressed, the fact that you feel crazy, is a sign of your intelligence. (laughs) And 
at that point, I was convinced I was a total nut job. <laughs> mm. And he convinced me that I wasn't, you know, and that actually all the things that made me feel crazy were my gifts. What a teacher. Yeah. I One day, it was after another two friends committed suicide, I was like, Bernie, I'm a tumbleweed. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. <laughs> And he said, sit a datun. <laughs> and I said, what's a datun? And he said, it's a 30-day meditation retreat. And I said, but I've never meditated before. And he's like, if you decide to do it, you'll do it. <laughs> Ooh. And so I did it. And I went, it was in Colorado, and it totally changed my life, you mm -hmm. know. And I, I learned how to connect with stillness. I learned how to open my heart. I learned what it felt like to release my judgments, my New York-itis is what I called it. <laughs> you know, I went in with so many judgments when I first got there, like, these aren't my friends. <laughs> and by the end of it, I was like in love with everyone there and felt a deep past life connection to every single person I made eye contact with and experienced magic and profundity in ways I'd never had before. And I called Bernie and I said, I'm cured, it fixed me. <laughs> and he was like, you should know, these feelings will pass. Uh. And they did. And I found that after any retreat I'd go to, I'd go and party even harder because <laughs> it was really? like way more fun and expansive and less neurotic. And then I would end up back in my dungeon of despair mm -hmm. and then would go back again until I finally realized I couldn't get away with it <laughs> anymore. Mm -hmm. And and then I wanted to get to a place where I could sustain that feeling of open heartedness and sensitivity and connection and I finally moved to a Buddhist retreat center and that became my whole life, you know, was practice and deep study of the nature of reality and mind and, and living in community with other people who were doing the same thing. And I started, I was seeing energies and I didn't have the maturity or groundedness to really work with it properly. Um, and I eventually moved to Boulder and then uh, had two teachers one was an astrology teacher one was an energy healing teacher and they both sort of saw gifts in me and you know took me to the level of being able to work with the gifts properly so that I knew how to be a super sensitive being in the world and and then apply that to helping other people you know instead of feeling insane mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and like hypersensitive and raw all the time um, which I still, I mean, I still do, <laughs> but I have tools now, and, and I understand that it's not a problem, you know. Mm. So your own dialogue with yourself has healed, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, I think we fall into K-holes when we feel bad about feeling bad. Mm. <laughs> mm. And so if I feel raw, vulnerable, messy, insane, <laughs> embarrassed, you know, it's like, okay, come to tea, you know, mm -hmm. be my honored guest, you know, I'm going to feel exactly as I feel right now without repressing it, without making up a story about how messed up I am. Genuine emotion only lasts two and a half minutes <laughs> if you let yourself feel it if you invite it to arise exactly as it is without altering it. After that, the, all the spins are self-created. Yeah, so I mean, I have to remind myself of that, but you know, it's become much easier and I see it as like a part of the mind training of meditation and Buddhism that I still, that I still work with in my day-to-day -day life. It's like that lag time between spinning and returning to center has become less and less you know and that reference point of stillness has become more and more you know and stronger and stronger and meditation has been the key to that or time alone or time in the wilderness all of the above yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I had to leave New York LA and go into the wilderness into you know wild places and more uh Say, you know, more contained places in order to really work with my mind and get more sensitive to the subtle currents of my mind 
and um, but now I feel ready to return and I think there have been lots of stages of my path my spiritual path one being Buddhism meditation solitary retreat group retreats you know intense Vajrayana practices mm-hmm. and having a teacher having a Buddhist teacher having you know energy healing as a as a path and having teachers in that realm as well and also I've you know plant medicine has been a big part of my path as well and accessing the deeper traumas that had really thick cellar doors with deadbolts (laughs) that needed some severe prying open Mm -hmm. and that you know daily meditation couldn't even come close to accessing and my understanding is that that's sort of like a almost a scandalous thing to say in sort of Buddhist worlds. Like there's a little bit of a friction between the meditation is the way and the, there are other tools, including plants that can, do those things go hand in hand? To me, they do. And what part of the reason I've moved away from calling myself a Buddhist is because I don't believe in dogma mm-hmm. on any level. And I think when I started engaging in plant medicines and finding that these lifelong traumas I could access and work through in a night, if anyone said that was a problem, I didn't respect them anymore, <laughs> you know? Or I fundamentally respected them, but I couldn't respect them as a teacher yeah. because my inner wisdom and my deep inner knowing w- would totally disagreed. And if anyone was going to say to me that healing my deep traumas was a problem, then that wasn't my path. I don't think everyone who's a Buddhist thinks it's a problem. In fact, I've sat in plant ceremonies with many Buddhists who are devoted practitioners. Um, But I think there are some misunderstandings when people become too religious or dogmatic and limit themselves to one way only that Mm -hmm. Like, this is the right way. This is the only way. And that's not even Buddhism, sorry. But the, it, the Buddhists say, when if you see the Buddha, kill the Buddha. Which means if you get too solid about the Buddha, then, okay, start over, you know. Mm. And the Buddha said, you know, use this raft of liberation. But once you get to the other shore, don't drag the raft around with you. If you start deifying the raft, you've missed the point. And there's so many different paths to liberation, and they all can work together really beautifully. And this new age we're moving into is the age of direct connection. No more guru, no more religion, no more dogma, you know. (laughs) It's just direct connection to self, heart, spirit. And so I think it's really interesting to see where all these different lineages and methods converge. And that's universal truth. Yes, and that's something I've been thinking about a lot in the context of plant medicine specifically because there are conversations happening around context and cultural appropriation that I think are worth having. But I also feel very aware just from my direct experience with these plant teachers that like they are plants that want to help people. They want to have a relationship with you. And that's an invitation that extends far beyond any particular, like, yes, have a ceremony, have a context for it. But I think it's missing the point to think that there's one context for one plant. Right. Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, I know I've, I've really... I think it's really beneficial when you first engage with something so vivid and so, you know, overpowering, (laughs) you know, to have a strong container, to have some, a shaman who's really experienced to be present with you and help you through that experience and cut through your trips and default to emptiness and things like that. But I also, you know, I sat with one shaman for a while who I'm so grateful but at some point it felt like okay I need to be wild and I need to be limitless in my feminine expression Mm. and I don't want a masculine disciplined shaman to tell me to be still and shut up and sit down and sit up straight you know and so (laughs) at some point I was like I can't sit with you anymore because I don't want to be reprimanded for doing it wrong because there is no wrong (laughs) 
Yes. <laughs> yes. But I am grateful for the strong container you've provided me thus mm-hmm. far. So what was what has been your journey with the medicine? Well, I I sat uh in a, in ceremony pretty much every month for one year straight just because I wanted I'm kind of like that where if I'm going to do something I'm going to do it legit you know like moving to the Buddhist retreat center you yeah. know <laughs> like learning everything there is to know about astrology you know or I'm I guess I'm an extremist um <laughs> or like deciding to do ayahuasca every month for a year to really understand it and and go deep with it and I also felt like to have that continuum where I didn't come out of that place of depth and open heart and healing, you know, and I just kept going deeper and deeper with it felt important in terms of rerouting, reconstructing my foundation and my, my neural pathways because I had a lot of trauma from childhood to rework and to heal and release. And I'm... It was, yeah, I'm really grateful for that. And now I'm more drawn to San Pedro because it's more about learning from nature and being in community and coming outside of yourself and sort mm. of relating with the phenomenal world and seeing the wisdom that exists in nature and that almost all the answers and all the healing we need is on this earth, mm-hmm. you know? And so that feels like more resonant with me now, but... I think that all the medicines are really helpful in different ways at different times in our lives. Mm. That's so resonant with me, what you're saying about how all the wisdom is already here. And I wonder if you could kind of unpack that a little bit, especially in terms of of the earth itself containing what we need. Yeah, well, I... The last San Pedro ceremony I did, I was up in the mountains in outside of Boulder, Colorado, and... I remember I was sitting in the creek and the, or the river was flowing, you know, and the earth just kept saying to me, give it all to me, I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dramas, the neuroses, the, you know, the suffering, the putrid emotions, just give it to me. It's like, it's almost like the metaphor of compost, that the waste is the nourishment for the earth. And my friend, Tori was there, and she's um, she is a flower farmer and a botanist, or she knows a lot about botany and plants. And she said to me, look at this tree, like right after that. And the tree was sort of oozing with sap, and it looked like a wound, but it was oozing with sap. And she said, you know, the tree takes all the waste from the earth and turns it into syrup and then gives it to us through its wounds. And that was like totally it. That was the metaphor, you know? Mm -hmm. And we both started crying, like tears were streaming down our faces and we really felt that. And that lesson was right there that wisdom was right there in this sort of everyday earthly phenomenon like just looking at a tree but how many times do we walk by trees and never notice wow so I feel like you're the perfect person to ask about integration because you do do these things so completely and not everybody wants to dwell in those spaces and not everybody can dwell in those spaces so What is the work to bring those lessons and messages back to society, to each other? How do we integrate that? (laughs) That's That's another big question. (laughs) No pressure. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I mean, I'm not all knowing, but I I can just tell you what. For you, how has it been? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think. The willingness to stay open to ourselves and to each other and to the profundity of nature, which requires staying open to the jagged edges and the the deeper, more challenging emotions. Like we can't be open to the bliss if we're not also open to the pain, 
but if we stay open to all of it, then the pain isn't a problem anymore, mm. you know? It's more like the repression of the pain or the feeling bad about the pain that causes us the real anguish, you know? But if we just allow that embrace of whatever arises and we celebrate it and we lean into it and we extract the beauty from it, it's like just as blissful as <laughs> happiness <laughs> I, like the other day on that same ceremony my friend said oh I I made a grave for my brother and she led us to this little cross she made from twigs and feathers and we wept with her she sang and we wept with her and it was almost excruciating grief it was so palpable the sadness but we all stayed open to it, and it almost felt like we were releasing something from for the universe, that we were helping something dislodge and become free. And it also was so binding in between our hearts, that sort of shared space of brokenheartedness was so beautiful and so rich. And I wouldn't trade it for any moment of momentary joy, you yeah. know? And so in terms of integration, it's like really having the courage to keep your heart open. And if you let yourself feel the harder feelings, the less fun feelings, <laughs> then you can also experience the magic, the profundity. It's all part of the feast, you know? and. Stay, I mean, staying grounded, too, so mm. above all, you know, it's almost like we have to start there, so if someone isn't grounded in their lives, then that's the place to start, so making your bed in the morning, making <laughs> a proper cup of tea, mm. all the sort of mundane world stuff is really important, too, we are humans, we have to embrace being humans, we have to like celebrate being humans and, and respect that we're human and do all the human things properly um, because there's really no difference between being a full human and being connected to profundity but we do have to start with earth um, and so I know for years I did nine to five work and I uh, was a rock climber and you know that was my path of grounding and I had to do that for years before I was ready to really harness the inner the deeper energetic work mm -hmm. you know and so I think it's good that we keep returning to earth and ground I feel like a lot of the things you just listed too are kind of under the umbrella of discipline yeah Discipline brings joy, is what the Buddhists say. Really? <laughs> yeah, joy and cheerfulness and discipline, I think, are connected. I found, too, that discipline is the real antidote to depression. If, like, I'm in a rut and I'm feeling sluggish and sad, you know, the discipline of sort of getting out of bed and faking it till I make it. And I know it's not that simple for everyone, but I don't want to diminish depression and the experience of depression. But there is, like, real power in discipline in terms of accessing joy yes because those emotions in the moment that create the resistance to doing the thing that will make you better if make me better at least if i if i do the thing if i go for the run if i make the food because that's just what i do it short circuits the whole conversation with myself about why or how or Totally. Yeah. I mean, and we don't want to. Our ego doesn't want to because we're like, no, our drama is real. Yeah. If, if I do the thing, it'll prove that it's not real and then I don't exist anymore. <laughs> <You know? laughs> totally. And I remember showing up at Bernie's office and being in a total state of like neurosis. And he had this stool where you could only, if you, if you didn't sit up straight, you would fall. <laughs> Whoa. And so he'd have me sit on this stool so that I'd actually sit up straight, which is a discipline, right? Oh. And as soon as I'd sit up straight, it would all dissipate and I'd be so mad, you know, I would resist it so hard. I'm like, no, I'm not going to sit on the stool. <laughs> My drama is real. You know, I am exist, you know, <laughs> and, and then, and then, 
<laughs> but as soon as I did, it was like, okay, that's it. It's gone. And so that's, it's like the discipline of sitting up straight when we're in the thick of our afflicted emotions. Sometimes it's all it takes. Like we don't want to admit it. And we want to say no, but that diminishes my blank. But no, I have, you know. Yeah. But if you actually try it, <laughs> it's really hard if we stubbornly resist it. But that, you know, that's the sort of more specific example of discipline brings joy. Discipline brings release. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sitting up straight is really like the most profound spiritual practice there is. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's so simple. It's so simple. So many of our problems are really simply anti- like have really simple antidotes, but we're just our egos don't like that. Mm. <laughs> well, it sounds like those those ten years of Buddhist practice you've taken a lot with you from that that you still carry in your everyday. Definitely. And in a way, I had to go in like really complicated circles to sort of get to the simplicity, you know, of like connect with nature. With all the wisdom you need is there. Sit up straight. Emo- genuine emotion only lasts two and a half minutes. It's like <laughs> I remember like ten years into being a hardcore meditation practitioner, feeling like deep afflicted emotions and wanting to do all my habitual patterns. I need to call my friend and spin and look at my tarot deck and Mm. eat a bunch of ice cream. And then I was like, wait, I've been trained for the last 10 years (laughs) to work with this. Maybe I should just do that. And I sat up straight and I actually looked myself in the eyes and I threw up. (laughs) And I threw up all of my self-loathing and I suddenly was completely out of that place of spinning and I felt this deep power and profundity and stillness that came from the core of my being and I realized that I had it all right there I just had been stubbornly (laughs) resisting and that was a real turning point on my spiritual path where I just felt such enormous universal love just expand from my heart and I think I wept for a few weeks after that but it's like I had to do the 10-year complicated (laughs) run through the maze to get to that place that was there from day one which was like just sit up straight and be with it. (laughs) Mm. When you do energy work, are you basically helping people come to that same place? Yeah. Yeah. So when I work with people doing energy work, I basically go into that place of non-conceptual mind is what the Buddhists call it. And I, I like that term. I'm not thinking I'm being, and I'm sitting up straight in that place of being in my core And then I lead others through visualization to still their minds and then help clear blockages in their various chakras and remember who they are, reconnect with their with their own source of healing and then go into their own state of what I call clear light energy and the Buddhist call clear light energy, which is really nowness, non conceptual mind, you know, and the true essence of who we all are. And so when I get to that place with people, I I steal in and and close. And that's really it. In some ways, it's very simple. You know, just getting people to the place of nowness and helping remove all the obstacles to nowness, you know. Are those obstacles just the things that we acquire from living life and surviving and dealing with each other? Yeah, I mean, I think it's repressed emotion you know Um. and so it ends up getting stuck in our bodies actually releasing tension in our physical bodies especially in our organs you know so sitting up straight then releasing that creates a profound shift and the places where we're not able to release they give us a clue as to where we're repressing where we're holding on where we're not able to open the cellar door and face the Mm -hmm. feeling and so yeah when we're releasing blockages together it's very visceral it's like in the body but it's connected to some deeper memory or fear or trauma that we haven't had the courage to look in the eyeballs yet you know Mm -hmm. and so that's really what the clearing is all about 
Are you saying, is the body like a map? You can tell where the tension is in the body, tells you what kind of emotion is being repressed? Yeah, in in a way. And you can have a conversation with it. Like, oh, I feel tension in my stomach that I'm not able to release. And then you can just get really curious about it. Mm -hmm. Like, what color is it? What shape is it? What does it feel like? Does it have a name? You know, is it male or female or neither? And then you just get really curious about that place of stuckness in your body and start talking to it and say, come, come as my guest, have some tea. <laughs> what message do you have for me? You know, and oftentimes it's, I'm trying to protect you from being hurt again. I'm trying to protect you from this wound happening again. And then when I, I do that work with people and I'll say, okay, well, do you feel like you're actually protecting blank or do you feel like you're actually keeping her from her freedom and liberation and ease? And it's like, okay, I might be keeping her from her. Mm. And it's like, okay, so thank you for your protection. Thank you for being here this whole time and protecting this person from all of this pain. And now we're ready to release you with love and gratitude. And so we can do that for ourselves, but we can also help each other do it because sometimes we need that, th that other person to sort of hold space for that process. But the more we're able to communicate with our bodies and get honest about those obstacles and those blockages and the places of tension in our bodies and sensitized to the messages they're holding. It's often really beautiful wisdom and it's often, um, it, it was put there by our intelligence originally. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing to judge. It's nothing to be mad at ourselves for. It's nothing to suffer with anymore. It's just gratitude and release. It feels like that process is so required for this age that we're coming into that you're describing. It's like the invitation is for all of us to do that work for ourselves. Yeah. We're facing so much uncertainty right now. We never really knew. I mean, we never knew <laughs> what the future was going to look like. But now it's just more obvious that we don't know. Yes. <laughs> you know? Because yes. so much is so obviously changing right now that it's impossible to deny. So in a way, we're really working with the true nature of reality more now than we used to as a collective, you know, before we really wanted to believe in safety. <laughs> After the war, Eisenhower era, every house is the same, every house is predictable, mother and father, stereotypical norms, we are safe, everything is predictable, you know, but like that was never real and that cr created a lot of suffering and a lot of repression, yeah. you know? <laughs> and so now, yeah, it's like actually going into those places where we're rep repressing and just relaxing. Just let's just give it all up. Like, let's just surrender. You know, it's like we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. And that's OK. You know, it's like I feel fear. OK, feel the fear. Move through it. Release it. I feel anger. OK, no problem. Feel the anger. Move through it. Release it. I feel resentment. Cool same steps feel and release and then we just we're really allowing ourselves to be more human more of who we are just be <laughs> i'm not going to judge you for feeling a feeling i'm not going to judge you for feeling bad i'm not going to judge myself for feeling a feeling or feeling bad and honestly that's part of the whole undoing the patriarchy right because the masculine was taught that the feminine is weakness, that the feminine is to be feared, that emotions are to be feared, emotions are weakness, right? And so this is undoing that patriarchal repression. It's like actually feeling our feelings is our strength. Feeling our feelings is our spiritual path, is our pathway to wisdom and liberation. We've just been taught otherwise because some other power wanted to keep us under their control. Right, we started looking outside of ourselves. Yeah, and we were taught to fear the source of our power, which is feeling our feelings. You're giving me really nice perspective because being on sort of a journey recently, I've been trying to figure out how to be open, and how to have healthy boundaries, but I, I kind of feel like what you're suggesting is that like, heartbreak is inevitable. Heartbreak is part of the human experience, and it's okay to go through heartbreak. 
Heartbreak is like my favorite feeling. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you sit up straight and let yourself feel your heartbreak, it's like the richest feast of a feeling. <laughs> and it connects us with every single person on this earth and being. And if we walk down the street with a broken heart, it's like suddenly we look in another person's eyes and we connect to their pain, we connect to their hearts. I think the, that real <laughs> awakening enlightenment is the feeling of sustained heartbreak and being in love with everyone yes. <laughs> at the same time. I mean, being human is heartbreaking. I mean, heartbreak is so hard <laughs> too, you know, and like makes you throw up and makes you question yourself <laughs> and makes you like not want to eat or eat too much or both. <laughs> you know, so it's also like losing these important reference points. So I don't want to diminish that, but it's sort of an opportunity to let's surrender that to the river. Let's surrender that to the earth and then give the maple <laughs> syrup from our wounds. And so it's, it's not like I'm awakened. I never get to suffer ever again. Right. That never happens, you know? It's more like, how are we relating to the suffering? That's what changes. It's like, do we surrender to the feelings? Do we transmute the feelings into maple syrup? <laughs> you know, do we give them away through our wounds? Or do we clamp down and create an ulcer and, or create cancer or create some huge knot in our throats, our chest, our stomach so that we can't eat for a year or for the rest of our lives or until we die or does it kill us, you know? And so... That's the difference. It's a subtle perspective shift between awake mind and a sleep mind. Just letting yourself feel and not being afraid of it is being well versus being sick or making yourself sick. It's being free in your mind versus being self-tortured. Well, I feel like just the fact that you had trauma in your childhood and you lost so many people that you love and you're here now on this beautiful path of like learning to have an open heart as much as you can all the time just you are the living example of that oh that that's nice <laughs> yeah I mean you just radiate it oh thanks well that's one way I relate to it. it's like why do I have to suffer more than the average person it's like oh so I can go to the edge of the cliff and find my way back and then help someone else do the same thing it's like I've been through so much that there's nothing that I can judge anymore and so I really have clients in severe circumstances and emotional states and you know I can love and embrace it because I've loved, had to love and embrace it in myself. And so I think that that goes back to that astrological understanding that our biggest struggles are our biggest gifts. It's what we have to offer the world. And if I find my way out of X pickle, you know, <laughs> then I can help someone else find their way out of X pickle. If you find your way out of some sort of painful place, then you can help your friend, your partner, your family member, a total stranger, like find their way off of that le that same ledge. And I think that's like true calling, right? Like when we figure out how to heal ourselves and then offer that to the world. And it can be anything. Lift driving can be really healing. <laughs> Creating a space for someone to enter the car and have a meaningful conversation. Podcasting, mm -hmm. meeting people and, and talking to them and hearing their stories and receiving their wisdom and sharing your own and then offering that to the world. It's like, it can be anything, but I think that's that definition of calling is just healing ourselves and offering it to the world. Mm. Beautiful, wow. <laughs> That's been, I'm just so grateful. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. I you have so, so much wisdom. Oh, that's so sweet. I'm so glad you came out to Greenport yeah. to meet me, and I got to have this beautiful, unexpected conversation with you yeah. today. And I want to say, too, you have a book coming out. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> it's right here. It's called The Stars Within You, A Modern Guide to Astrology, and it's um, published by Roost Books and distributed by Penguin. And it's coming out October 23rd. If you're in New York, there's a book release party um, at the Alchemist Kitchen October 25th. 
and then there's one in Los Angeles at the Regime de Flore office, October 27th. Awesome. Yeah. And my website is etherealculture.com, and my Instagram is etherealculture. It's one of my favorite accounts of all time. Highly recommend. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.